Last time we said that there are two descriptions for electrostatic interaction. We said when we consider electrostatic interaction, there are two descriptions. One is action at a distance point of view second is feed idea then we explain these ideas in action at a distance we said the interaction between the two charges is direct and instantaneous in field idea, we said the interaction is neither direct nor instantaneous, right? Uh, why we moved from action at a distance to field idea, I have already explained that. We said there that in action at a distance, interaction is instantaneous which violates the principle of spatial theory of relativity which says that c the speed of light in vacuum is three, which is 3 into 10 s by 8 meter per second is the speed limit of this universe that's why we introduced field idea and that field idea is in accordance with this speed limit. Okay. Now, surrounding any charge, how we define electric field? We know if we have some charge, for example, point charge Q1, positive charge, Surrounding this charge, there will be an electric field. There will be electric field surrounding this charge. And surrounding any charge, there will be electric field. Whether it is positive charge or negative charge. The question is how we <coughs> define that. So we define that this way. If I have, so I write first, the electric field. See how we define it. Suppose there is some charge Q. Let it be positive. Now in its neighborhood, I select some point P. Let E subscript P be the electric field due to Q at point P. How we define it, we say we will take it cannot be a small positive charge. It is also called a test charge. Right? So in order to find electric field at point P due to this plus positive charge Q, we say we will take test charge Q naught 
to point P and calculate the force on this test charge due to this Q. Let that force be F. Then we divide that force by this test charge. The resulting quantity is the electric field at point P. I repeat, I have a charge Q, positive charge. Now I select some point P in its neighborhood. I have to find electric field at point P. What I do, I take a test charge. Test charge means a small positive charge. Place it at point P. Find the force on test charge due to Q. Let that be F. Divide that force by test charge. I get the electric field at point P. This is the definition of electric field. You understand this definition, you know it already. I'm just revising it in order to move forward. First thing, this electric field is a vector quantity. As you know, it is. it can be written as one by Q naught times F. One by Q naught is a scalar more precisely positive scalar, positive scalar times a vector f, the yield is a vector, and that vector will be in the same direction as the force. So test charge is positive, so the direction of the force on test charge at point P will be radially outward, so the electric field at point P will be radially outward. Second thing, this electric field will have SI unit of Newton per Coulomb. Newton per Coulomb is its unit, SI unit. Force will contain both charges, Q and Q0. But when you divide this force by Q0, in order to get electric field, that electric field will contain only Q, this Q0 and Q0 is going to cancel out. So we say at point P, the electric field due to Q is independent of the test charge. It only depends on this Q. This Q we call source charge. Right? So this is how we define electric field. Now, there is an idea called superposition principle. Superposition principle. What is superposition principle? It says if there are many charges, for example, that there will be one charge Q1, another charge Q2, another charge Q3. There can be many. I am taking an example of three charges. Now I have a point P in their neighborhood. I want to find the electric field at point P due to these three charges. Right? So EP is the electric field at point P, right? Superposition principle says, if you have to calculate the electric field at point P, what do you do? First you find the electric field at point P due to Q1. One of the charges I am taking Q1. Assume when you are calculating electric field at point P due to Q1, assume two and three are absent. So let E1 be the electric field at point P due to Q1, assume two and three are absent. Similarly, find electric field at point P due to Q2, assuming one and three is absent. Let that be E2 and find the electric field at point P due to Q3 Assuming one and two, 
R epsilon. Let that be E3. Then your EP, that is the net electric field at point P, will be equal to the vector sum of these three fields. Right? So you have to vectorially add E1, E2, and E3 to get the net electric field at point P. This idea is called superposition principle and it is valid for any number of charges. For example, if there are n charges and you select a point P in their neighborhood and you want to find the electric field at point P, you have to follow similar procedure. This sum will contain n terms, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, and so on up to En. So this is superposition principle. Right. There is an idea called electric lines of force. What is that? Electric lines of force is actually graphical representation of the electric field surrounding some charge. Is a graphical representation. For example, now every charge, whether it is point charge, charge can have different configuration in space. It can be point charge, it can be in the form of a line, it can be line charge. It can be sheet, it can be sheet of charge, right? It can be sphere of charge, any configuration it can have, but in all cases, there will be electric field surrounding the charge. Now that electric field will have a mathematical expression, for example, If I have point charge Q and I select a point P, which is R distance from this charge, and let R cap be a unit vector radially away from source charge Q, then the electric field at point P as in mathematical expression, it is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q by r square r cap. Right? So it has a mathematical expression. Right? Similarly, every electric, uh, every distribution of charge will have an electric field surrounding it, and that will have a mathematical expression. This is one way of describing the electric field surrounding a charge that is using mathematical equations. Second way is graphical representation. But this graphical representation must be in accordance with mathematical expression. That means if I use this example of a point charge, electric field, it says the electric field is proportional to the magnitude of the source charge and inversely proportional to the distance square of the point in question from the charge. Same must be depicted by the graphical representation. So we have framed certain rules for drawing these electric lines of force 
surrounding charges. For example, we know <laughs> electric field surrounding a point, positive point charge everywhere is outward. So we draw, I'm not summarizing the rules because you know it from your previous classes, just revising it. If I have a positive point charge, <clears throat> On the electric lines of force, we show symmetrically leaving from the point charge radially outward. So this is the pattern of the electric lines of force surrounding this positive point charge Q. If I have a negative point charge minus Q, then the pattern of the electric lines of force surrounding this charge will be like this. The electric field will be inward everywhere. Pattern will be somewhat like this, right? One, this arrow is wrong. The pattern will be like this. What happened? Let me fix it. So, pattern is like. Similarly, if we have a dipole, what is the definition of the dipole, electric dipole? We have two point charges, Q and minus two point charges of same magnitude, but opposite in sign. This configuration is called electric dipole. So this electric dipole has a field pattern like this. This is the pattern of electric lines of force surrounding an electric dipole. Right. So every charge configuration has an electric field surrounding it and we graphically represent it by electric lines of force. Now, you need to remember that electric lines of force emanate or leave from positive charge. Electric lines of force end on negative charges. So sometimes we say positive charges are sources of electric lines of force and negative charges are sink, sinks of electric lines of force, right? Another thing you need to remember, electric field is a vector. There's a magnitude and direction. Now that magnitude of the electric field surrounding a charge is proportional to the density of electric lines of force. See, when you move away from this positive charge, the density of lines of force decreases. That means electric field is decreasing as is indicated by the mathematical expression. EP is inversely proportional with R squared. So as you go away from the charge, lines of force are becoming thin. Your density is decreasing. That means electric field magnitude is decreasing. Direction is indicated by the arrow. Here electric field is outward. Here is it is inward. If the electric lines of force is a curve like this, then electric field at a point on the line 
is along the tangent. For example, here electric field is this way. Here electric field is this way. You have to draw a tangent, right? Electric lines of force cannot intersect. Two electric lines of force cannot intersect like this because that will violate the idea of the electric field. So you need to remember this. So this way we depict electric field surrounding some charge using the lines of force idea. And we have another idea for the electric flux. The electric flux. How we define electric flux? Sometimes we write it, the flux of the electric field. As I already said, the electric field is a vector and we have discussed in previous lectures the idea of the field. You can have a temperature field, you can have a pressure field, you can have a velocity field. Likewise, we have an electric field surrounding some charge. At every point surrounding an electric charge, we're associating a vector, electric field vector. So that space plus the vectors which we associate with those points surrounding an electric charge is the electric field. Graphically, we represent it by electric lines of force. For example, if there is a uniform electric field at a certain region of space, it is depicted using electric lines of force by equally spaced straight lines of force. So this means it's a uniform electric field because density everywhere is same. Because density is proportional to magnitude of the electric field. So this is uniform electric field. Uniform E. E stands for electric field. Now the electric flux is denoted by We denote electric flux to fix it first. Let me fix this first. Okay, now I have a pen. So I said these equally spaced electric lines of force represent uniform electric field. Uniform electric field means since electric field is a vector quantity in this region of space. At every point, the strength magnitude of the electric field is same and direction of the electric field is also same. 
That's the meaning of uniform electric field. Now we define here a quantity called electric flux. I represent this by phi subscript E. We name it electric flux. How we define it? We do it this way. We say if we place some surface having area, a surface with area A, right? We place a surface with area A in this electric field. We can place this surface in the electric field in different ways. I mean to say, you can place this surface in this electric field in different orientations. You can place this in a way that its plane is perpendicular to the electric lines of force. You can place this area in the way that its plane is coinciding with the lines of force. Right? Or you can uh, place in between these extreme positions. Now, in different situations, different number of electric lines of force will penetrate through this area. Now, this electric flux, we define this quantity in such a way that it gives us the major of electric, or I should say, major of number of electric lines of force passing through the area A, right? So electric flux is a quantity which gives us the measure of number of electric lines of force passing through a given area. Here we are considering this area A. Now how we construct this quantity in order to fulfill this requirement that it gives us the measure of number of electric lines of force passing through the area A. We say we will represent this area by a vector, area vector. That area vector, we will represent uh, this area by a vector, which is placed perpendicular to the area and its length is proportional to the area. So length of this area vector is proportional to the area and its direction is perpendicular to the surface of the area. So when this area vector is in the direction of the field, as I am showing in this figure, at that time the plane of area A is perpendicular to electric lines of force. Then we say this electric flux phi E, we define it as dot product of this area vector and electric field, right? So we define this electric flux as a dot product of two vectors. That means this electric flux is a scalar quantity, right? So the definition of dot product, this is Ea cos theta, where theta is the angle between 
electric field and area vector. So if theta is zero degree, that means if area vector is similarly oriented as E, cos zero is one, electric flux will be E. If theta is 180 degree, cos theta will be minus one, then it will be minus E. If theta is 90 degree, that means if area vector is perpendicular to E, cos 90 is zero, then it will be zero. So this way we define electric flux. Uh, in this definition, it is assumed that E is constant over area A, right? E is constant over area A. What about its SI unit? It will be Newton per Coulomb for electric field and for area, you will multiply meter square. So this is SI unit of electric flux. Now, then we generalize this electric flux idea. My electric field may be non-uniform, right? And my surface may not be plain. It may be curved like this. So we say what we do, we divide that surface into infinite small parts and represent each part by an area vector dA, right? And what we do, we define, uh, find electric flux using this definition for each area piece as e dot dA, then we add these dot products over this whole surface. That is, we integrate. And that will give us the electric flux for this surface, right? I'm saying if my electric field is non-uniform and my surface is not plain, then we divide the surface into infinite small parts area pieces represent each area piece by a vector perpendicular to the area find the dot product of e with this little area vector da then add these dot products over the whole surface that will give, give us the electric flux right now if the surface is closed There is one thing, this is my electric field. Now I put some surface in it. That surface is closed. So if surface is closed, in that case, I have a convention that area vector is taken as outward normal. You have to remember this. So area vector here will be this way, outward normal. Area vector here will be this way, outward normal. Area vector here will be this way. Area vector here will be this way. Then you follow the same procedure. Find e dot da for each piece and integrate over the whole surface. That will give you the electric flux through the surface. And when the surface is closed, we place a circle on this integral. You have already done this. This actually is surface integral. We have a vector, and we have a surface, we dot it with these area vectors, and for closer surface, we place a circle on the integral. So this way we calculate the electric flux. Now, because of this convention, area vector uh, taken as outward normal for closer surfaces, what happens? Leaving flux is positive, and entering flux is negative. Because wherever flux leaves, lines of force leave the surface, there will be an acute angle between electric field and area vector. 
So cos theta will be positive, flux will be positive. And wherever lines of force enter the surface, there will be an obtuse angle between area vector and electric field. Cos will be, cos theta will be negative and flux will be negative. So when we calculate electric flux through some closed surface, it can be positive, it can be negative, it can be zero, depending on whether the positive uh, pieces of the dot product, I mean positive contributions, if positive contributions in this sum and negative contributions are equal, then it will be zero at flux, so the surface will be zero. If positive contribution is more than negative contribution, net flux through the surface will be positive. And if negative contribution of the flux is more than the positive contribution, the net electric flux through the closed surface will be negative. So this was or is the idea of electric flux. Then we have another thing, another idea here, Gauss's law of electrostatics. Before giving its statement, I will give you some background. We said that if we have some charge Q and we select some point P surrounding it, and if we have to find the electric field at point P, we take a test charge Q naught, place it at point P, find the force F, divide that test uh, forced by the test charge, we get the electric field at point P. And this force F will get using Coulomb's law is obtained using Coulomb's law, which we have already discussed. So when we find electric field surrounding some charge at a given point using this way, we find force divided that by test charge, we say we are finding the electric field using Coulomb's law. Now this Coulomb's law method, we can use for any charge distribution. You can find this way electric field surrounding a point charge. You can find it for, for line of charge, a ring of charge, or electric dipole, right? Only one thing will be there that sometimes the charge distribution is complicated and the calculation is complicated. But we can do it always using Coulomb's law. Now, Gauss's law of electrostatics gives us an alternative method an alternative method, right? Alternative method for finding the electric field. I repeat, we can find electric field surrounding any charge distribution using Coulomb's law method. Sometimes calculation is easy, sometimes it's very complicated. We have an alternative method. We can use Gauss's law of electrostatics for finding the electric field, right? And Gauss's law is more general. It is more General, we're not given statement of causes are yet. I'm first giving the background. It is more general than Coulomb's law. That means Coulomb's law is contained in Gauss's law. 
you can obtain Coulomb's law from Gauss's law. Now you cannot use Gauss's law everywhere. This thing you need to remember. Gauss's law is valid everywhere, but for calculation purposes, we cannot use it everywhere. It is useful only in those situations where there is some sort of symmetry involvement. Symmetry involvement. Right? I'm saying Coulomb's law is applicable everywhere. Gauss's law is valid everywhere, but not applicable everywhere. It is useful and applicable only in those situations where there is symmetry involvement. And in those situations, calculation using Gauss's law is very easy than Coulomb's law method. So we have Gauss's law. Now before giving its statement, I will give its statement and explanation in next lecture. I will give you the homework. I will give you some questions, easy questions that will help you in understanding the ideas. So, homework is. your question an alpha particle alpha particle is what the nucleus of a helium atom has a mass of 6.64 into 10 raised power minus 27 kilogram and a charge of plus 2e Plus two e what are the magnitude and direction of the electric field that will balance its weight I repeat the question, an alpha particle, the nucleus of a helium atom has a mass of 6.64 into 10 raised power minus 27 kgs and a charge of plus 2e. What are the magnitude and direction of the electric field that will balance its weight? Remember the value of E 
E has the value 1.602 into 10 raised power minus 19 coulomb. To solve this question, let's solve for today. Thank you. God bless you. Assalamualaikum.